Hello everyone and thank you for your time and your interest in our topic. Uh, my name is Mustafa Shami from Egypt and in this uh, session we will cover how we can integrate our GRC with the GDPR regulation, the new one as you know, together in one framework. First of all, I would like to introduce my company and myself. My company is called Egypt, stands for Egyptian Pite, but it's combined, one word, it's considered a market leader in the Middle East and North of Africa in the fields of assessment, consultancy, training, and audit. In these fields, mainly the service management system, information security, business continuity management system, quality management, risk management, and the business analysis too. For more information, you can visit egypt.net. And for myself, I am Mustafa Shami, the consultancy and audit manager. Um, I have uh, something like about 15 or 16 years now of experience. Uh, it started with IT infrastructure and security, and after some time, it's uh, eventually moved to IT service management, GRC, information security management, and business continuity management. I will be more than happy to have any communication on my email. It's mustafa.alshami at egypt.net. And now, let's move to our topic today. Today we will cover just five topics, or as we can, five points in our topic, but they are detailed. We will start with GRC and do we need it? Then we will move to GDPR, what, where, when, who, and why, because we notice that many people don't know what is GDPR, although their company should be compliant with them. And what does it mean to have a GDPR compliance in your organization? And how we can turn challenges into opportunities because it's possible. And as we can see, that many speakers in this conference are talking about combined management systems. As you can see in, in two or three sessions now, it's one of the common uh, points we are talking about. And what is next? What we can do after this conference when we come back to our offices? For the GRC, do we, need it? do we need it? We have a lot of people now talking about what is GRC. We have some people, the IT Governance Institute, they are saying governance is the set of responsibilities and the practices exercised by the board of expert, uh, ex executives management with the goal of providing strategic direction and so on. We have others who are saying that GRC is about eight universal outcomes, something like achieve business objectives, enhance organizational culture, and so on, while others are saying it's simple. It's only about the G, the governance, reliable achievement of objectives, and while addressing uncertainty, which is risk, and at the same time, and acting with integrity, which is, which is compliance and others describing the GRC professionals and how can they do their job. For me, GRC is simple. Let's talk about governance at the beginning, but from the IT perspective, it's all about how to align IT and all its operations to business strategic objective. And by the way, it's a continuous activity. You can do it just once. You will do it all the time. And at the same time, while you are trying to align the IT goals with the business strategic objectives, you will have uncertainty, which is risk. Because as you know now, we have cybersecurity, we have information security risks, and a lot of risks all the time. And this is why we should have a dedicated discipline for managing uncertainty, whether it's a positive opportunity or a negative risk. And at the same time, we have a lot of laws, regulations, and this is why we need compliance. And by the way, compliance doesn't need to be external, something like laws from the government. It can be internal by fulfilling and achieving what the top management needs, what the stakeholders need. It's a type of compliance at the same time. When we are talking about the G and R and C, all of them are continuous activities, which means we can't do it just once. We will do it all the time. So do we need it? What about the benefits and risks? 
The first benefit is achieving the organization's objectives while minimizing resources and keeping risk within the acceptable level, the risk appetite, as we can see. Understanding and achieving the stakeholders' expectations and operating within defined legal, contractual, social, and ethical boundaries. What about if we don't care? We don't like GRC. We don't like to be compliant. You will have these risks. The first one is losing the organization's vision, neglecting its objectives, and wasting its resources, which leads to losing the stakeholders because you are not achieving their expectations, and at the same time, you will destroy the organization image. And in some cases, you may pay a lot of fines, and in some cases, it will lead to seizing operation for some companies or banks or whatever. So GRC is not easy. All of us need it. And at the end, for the GRC, it's all about doing more with less, achieving the objectives with the minimum resources, and having risk under our risk appetite level as an organization. OK, what about the GDPR? So let me ask you a question. How many of you know GDPR? OK, just two. OK, and let's have the second question. What about your organizations? Not about you individually, for the organizations. Is the organization of any one of you is interested to be compliant with GDPR? Yeah, but the problem is not this. The problem is that some companies don't know if they are within the scope of GDPR or not. And this is why we will cover it in more details. For the GDPR, as many of you may know, it's a new regulation in the European Union. It's about the personal information personal information, and it contains 173 regulations and 11 chapters. As you can see, it's about general provisions, principles, rights of the data subject. What is a data subject? Do you know it? What is a data subject? Is it a customer? Is it a client or what? When we are talking about a customer or a client, we are talking about somebody who pays money to get a service or a product. But he must pay money. This is why he's called customer or client. In this case, we are not talking about those who are paying money alone. We have what's called data subject. So for example, if your organization is developing a mobile application, which is the users are using it for free, they are not paying money, something like WhatsApp. Have any one of you paid a $1 for WhatsApp? No, it's a free. Okay, what about us? Now we are not client, we are not... What? What are the names that can be said for these people? We are data subjects. Yeah, users. But in this regulation, it's called data subjects. It's about someone who is using a product or a service, whether he pays or not the fees for this product or service. So this is all about the GDPR. We have 11 chapters. We will cover some of them while we are going through the presentation. Where it's applied, here is a trick. It should be applied inside the European Union the 28 countries, but no, because it's about individual. Which individuals? We have three categories. People who are the citizens of the European Union countries. This is the first category. The second one, people who are living inside any country of the European Union, even if they are not citizens, they are just living there. And the third category, people who are traveling to European Union. So for example, I am Egyptian. I am not a citizen in a country of these, and I am not living here. I am here just for three days, and my data is under the GDPR protection now. Which means, although we are talking about the EU, but we are talking about a wider scope, 
not only the people who are living inside EU. And for the win, it was adopted about two and a half years ago, and now it's applied starting from the 25th of last May. So it's applied. Maybe many organizations haven't heard about it, but because there is no great fine until now, whenever we have a crisis, all organization will know about it. And this is a problem we would like to escape from. For who? Which type of data? We are not talking about personal data, not other types of data. And when we talk about personal data, we have three types. The first one, which is a clear data, pieces of information about somebody. So for example, if we are talking about my email, my email is directly attached to Mustafa Shami. It's my piece of information. My name, my address, my driving license, and so on. So it's direct pieces of information related to somebody. And in some cases, we can have what is called pseudonymized, which means we have a lot of data, and we don't know who are the owners of these data. But at the same time, if we can have some calculations, we can reach to them. So for the first type, it's within the GDPR. The second type, it's within the GDPR. But for the third type, it's not. And this type is whenever we have a data which is anonymized, which means we don't know the owner of these pieces of information. For example, about a few months ago, the Turkish government in Turkey provided a lot of information about something like millions of refugees from Syria just in a competition. What type of competition? We would like to know how they feel, how they live, how is life there, uh, how, how is their life inside Turkey, which means we would like to know if they are happy or not. But we don't know what is this piece related to which person. So at this time, it's the third type. We have phone calls, we have SMS texts, but they are not related to direct people. You can't know. You can take the data, you can participate in the competition, you can win it. But at the same time, you don't know who are the owners. This is the third type of personal information which is out of the GDPR scope. So if you are organization, if your organization is dealing with the first type, which is a clear personal information, or the second type, which is semi-clear, it's not directly pointing to persons, you should take care about GDPR. Okay, data about what? We are saying personal data. Personal data is a lot of types, by the way. So we can say something like biography, the appearance, workspace and education, private life, health data, and criminal convic convictions and offense, which means if someone has a problem 10 years ago, 10 years ago, his conviction should be removed now from the records and he should be treated equally like others. And what about children? If we are talking about children, think about internet applications and especially applications on their mobiles and their mobile devices. And if we can take some examples of the processing your organization may have, we can have staff management, staff, they are my own employees. Yes, if you have a branch or if your company is working inside any country in the European Union, the information of your staff is personal information, like salary, like address, like phone number, and so on. And the payroll, is it? okay. Access to or consultation of contacts database containing personal data, like what? Like a call center. What about if you are a bank and you have a call center covering how many millions of your customers in a European country? So they have the names of the customers, they have their accounts, they have all the transactions, so it's personal information. Sending promotional emails, and all of us is 
suffering from it. Promotional emails, shredding documents containing personal data, posting or putting a photo of a person on a website. He should consent. Okay. Storing IP addresses or MAC addresses and even video recording. So it's not easy now. Okay. If you are interested, we need to know more information about G the GDPR. The first piece of information is who is the data processor and who is the data controller because we are talking about who. Here we are talking about the people, the data subjects who own their own personal information. And what are the types? Here we have under who the data processor and the data controller. And what is the difference? Data processor is the one who determines the purposes and means of the processing of personal data. We can say it's the top management of a services provider. So if we have a company provide services or products to people inside the European Union or traveling to European Union, the decision makers will be called data processor. Okay? Sorry, data controller. This is the data controller. What about processor? It can be combined, by the way. If we are processing their data inside our organization, so the organization will be the controller and the processor at the same time. What about if we have something like an outsourced process? Or if we have a call center, the, the, the most famous uh, outsourced process, the call center. So for this case, the call center company will be the processor, which is processes personal data on behalf of the controller. So we can have them both combined if we process the data by ourselves. And if we have a different company, so it will be the processor. And by the way, if your organization is a processor, you should comply with GDPR too, legally. So let's have some examples about the data processor and data controller. This is a very simple example. It's about a data subject, which can be one of two types, buying products from stores, from shops, or buying services from online. At the same time, we have it as a customer. But in this case, it's not a customer, it's not a client, because in many cases, they don't pay money. They take free services. So they are called data subjects. They are taking services and products, whether for money or for free. And we have their information stored inside our information systems. I'm talking about myself in this example as a controller. So I am a controller, provide services and the products, and know what are their information stored inside our information systems. But any provider like this one must have suppliers, suppliers. In this case, they are processors or not. It depends on this type of relationship. It will be changed to be something like this. What is the difference? Here, it, they don't have any access to the information. They only provide products and services, supplies. In this case, they have access to the information about my data subjects. And what about this scenario? They have more clear information about my data subjects. And the most critical situation is this one. Why? Because here, they provide us with products and services. But here, they provide us with agreements and they provide the services and the products directly to the data subjects. Like the call center. It is a call center situation, by the way. You are a bank or a big company and you have your call center process is outsourced to another company. And they have the data of the data subjects and they provide the call center service directly and you are not in the cycle. So this is the highest risk situation you can have in these type of relations. Okay, in this case, in this case, 
you need to have what's called a DBO and no a DBA. What is it? A DBO, it's a data protection officer. It's an internal employee inside your organization who is responsible for GDPR compliance, organizational awareness, all the employees, giving advice and making decisions in respect to his data processing. And at the same time, he should know what is the supervisory authority in your country. Because we have now a lot of questions from many people around the world asking us about, we know that we have, like this one, it's an example, we have a data protection authority in many countries in Europe, but what about outside of Europe? So for example, if we are talking about my country, we are talking about Egypt, we don't have something like this in Egypt. What about if my company is like a service provider or an indirect service provider? And I need to comply with GDPR. I don't have something like this inside my, com my country. What shall I do? So the DBO should know which country you are providing services to residents in this country and should have a direct contact with their data protection authorities. They are independent public authorities that supervise through invest investigative and the corrective powers, the application of the data protection law. So if you don't have a DBA inside your country, try to know the countries you are providing services to residents or people traveling there and have the contact of them. You can have the full list from this URL. It's easy. And all the countries are listed with all their contact information. Why do we need a GDPR. It's looks to all the people around us. Everyone is having not only one device, they're having more than one mobile device. We have a lot of information about everyone. And currently we have what is called data science. Do you know what is data science? It's a new field of science. It's about computer and IT science. It's about math and the statistics. And at the same time, we have domain and business knowledge, subject matter experts. So we can know everything about someone. And at the same time, you can look to the number of millions of most famous social network sites worldwide. And some of them is above billion, like Facebook. More than a third of the people on Earth have accounts on Facebook. And number of social media users worldwide from 2010 and for 11 years to 2021, it's like this. Which means in 2021, half of the people on Earth will have accounts. It's not easy. Just imagine that one service provider, even even for free, you don't pay money, have all the information they need for you and your life and your every activity you are doing in your day, like search engines. And at the same time, we have number of monthly active Facebook users worldwide in something like 10 years, and you see the increase. It's not normal. And here are some com countries who are the leading countries on Facebook. Something like India. India alone, we have 270 million subscribers. So it's not easy to have all these numbers of people. And there is no protection. Okay, what about GDPR compliance? How can I have it? First of all, let's talk about penalties. Because if we don't know the penalties, we will not be interested. So we have two levels of penalties. The first one, if we don't have uh, big non-conformities, something like minor non-conformities, it will be 2% of global annual turnover. But take care, it's not about turnover, it's about global annual turnover, which means if your company is working in five countries, 
it's a small example by the way because I, I know some companies working in, in 30 and 50 and 70 countries. So if your company is working in just five countries and there is one incident, one incident in one country, you will pay 2% of your annual turnover, not in this country. It will be in the five countries. So it's not easy. What about major non-confirmities? It will be 4%. And in this example, it's 10 million euro. And in this example, it's 20 million euro. And the problem is, whichever is greater. The bigger number you will pay. If your company is working inside the European Union, you must comply with GDPR. And what about if your company is working or resides outside of the European Union? You are not secure because you are dealing with information of a personal information, data subjects inside the, the, the European Union too. And at the same time, you can visit the Europol. It's like the Interpol, by the way, but it's for Europe only. And you will find that the CEO is saying that we are welcoming GDPR. What does this mean? <laughs> they are waiting for fine. Okay, whatever they have, they will move. Okay, so for now we need to know, is it for me? Does my organization need it or not? At the beginning, you should ask, is my organization located in the European Union or not? If yes, <laughs> it will move directly to, is my organization processing data related to offering services and or products? If yes, you should comply with GDPR. It is the simplest way. But what about no? No, my organization doesn't locate, uh, is not located inside the EU. So do, you, uh, do our data subjects live or reside in the EU? And I think that we can say that 80% of those who will comply with GDPR are inside this box. And if yes, if they are provide services and the products, you will go to the GDPR. What about no? Are our data subjects traveling? It is the same, but it's less than this. Because for travel, you can have someone like me traveling for two or three days. The risk is not great. But if you have something like providing services to people living there, you will have a continuous risk. So if yes, you will go through the same box. If no, GDPR doesn't apply. What about this box? We have yes and no. For no, is the data processing taking place in my organization linked to behavior monitoring in EU or not? If you don't provide a service or a product, are you monitoring people or not? If you don't monitor people and you don't provide service or a product, you provide something else with, which we don't know until now, you shouldn't comply with GDPR. It will not be a must for you. Okay, if you decided that Yes, I should comply with GDPR. You should know what is the compliance principles. We have six principles inside the GDPR. The first one is data minimization, which means don't collect information more than what you need to have. So, for example, if you need to have three pieces of information, like the name, the address, the telephone number, they are enough. Don't take 10 pieces of information. What you like, what you don't like, what you recommend, what you don't rec you don't need them. So don't take them. Integrity and confidentiality. Try to say what you are using these pieces of information for and try to keep them confidential. A storage limitation, which means if I provide you with a service or a product and you are using this service for something like one year and after this year you don't like to subscribe again. And you said, I will not use the service. So I should delete all your information. Accuracy. And for the accuracy, it's something important. If we are talking about uh, insurance company and I have an account in this company and what about saying that I am not a smoker, by the way, and inside the application, they have an error inside their system. And it said, Mustafa is a smoker. 
No, I'm not a smoker because it will cost me a fortune because I will lose my insurance if I have a problem because I'm not a smoker. So all the data you collect should be accurate. Purpose limitation. You should mention why do you need these three pieces of information. And lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. Whenever you need them, you will use them. And at the, at the same time, we have seven rights of the data subject. As we know, we, we, we have now a new term, which is a data subject. And each data subject has seven rights. And you should provide him with these seven rights. The first one is right to restriction of processing. So whenever you have a data subject who said, I don't like to process my data, please cease processing, you will do it. Right to be informed. Why do we need this information? How you are processing them and how long you will keep them. Right to access by the data subject. At any time, you will have an email from a data subject asking you, please tell me what information you have about me and how can you process them or how do you process them. Right to rectification, to change, to updated. Right to object. I don't like to use my information in this application or in this way. Right to data portability, which means if I have two service providers and I have an account in one of them, I would like to take my account and my type of services from this service provider to another one. It's legal now to move all your information and it will be deleted from the first one. And the last one is right to release or what is called right to be forgotten. What does this mean? When I say I don't need this service or this product anymore, please don't use my data. Please don't send me any emails because we have tons of emails about the same topic and we don't need it. So please delete my contact and don't contact me again. Right to be forgotten. Try to do something like this with a company like Google. Whenever you are opening a browser, searching for something, he knows who is using the computer and all information about you. So try to do something with this. Yeah. All the results will be totally different. So try to, to, to do the same search. It will be totally different. Turning challenges into opportunities. As many colleagues said today that we have what's called a management systems which are combined. We can have it here too. So if we are talking about the GDPR, GDPR and other ISO standards, it's related because it's talking about the personal information and it's a type of security issue. It's mentioned in the ISO 27001, in the ISO 20001, in the governance 38500, in the risk management 31000, in the business continuity because I need to continue my business and I don't have, to, I don't need to have fines, big fines, and in the information security, risk management, and so on. We have a lot of standards talking about the same topic. And at the same time, it's not only about standards. We have a lot of bodies of knowledge and regulations and frameworks talking about personal information and, the, and their security. And this is why it will be easy or tough to implement it. We can make it easy. But before we are talking about what we can propose to you, let's have a simple situation. We have an organization which is interested in the GDPR, in the ISO 27000 for the Information Security Management System, ISO 20000 for the Service Management System, and ISO 22301 for the Business Continuity Management System. For each management system, they will have assigned resources, and they will have a vendor. And at the same time, they will have a management system, or we can call it a knowledge base. So it will be a hassle to have something like this. And at the same time, believe it or not, they are still interested in other standards and other regulations every now and then. So it will not be easy to have all these types of compliance. So this is what we are proposing, to have only one team 
It can be called a GRC, Govern Governance Risk Compliance, or a new term which is called Service Management Office. It's like the BMO, but it's SMO, Service Management Office. And this team or department having a dedicated knowledge management system and combined management systems. And at the same time, there is two types of regulations and best practices and the frameworks. Some of them is implemented. They can assign dedicated resources. And some of them is intended to be or planned to be implemented soon. They can have the same or other resources. And they can unify their vendors and taking discounts and having combined audits, combined assessments, and so on. So by having a single integrated department for this, it will be easy for all to implement not only the GDPR, but GDPR and others, whether they are body of knowledge or, or regulations or different ISO standards. At the end, we will have what's called doing more with less. And for some companies, which I know some of them, be as you go. Or we can say it, be as you grow. So you will be for what you need, whenever you need. Don't invest in something you don't need it right now. So be as you grow. What about the next step? If you think that your organization would like to have GDPR compliance inside, what can we do? The first, of thing, the, the first thing we can do is determine, is it for my organization or not? And we have a diagram for it, okay? So after that, if yes, update your GRC framework accordingly to include the GDPR. And after that, decide, do it yourself or you need someone else to do it for you? If you have experience, if you have experienced resources which are competent, they can do it for you. If not, don't waste your time. You can have it in a smart way by hiring someone else to do it. And at the beginning of the implementation, you will need a DBO and define the related DBA. And by the way, you can have more than DBA if you are working with more than country at that point, you will have a DBA for each European country inside the European Union. Conduct a data protection impact analysis or assessment, which means I have something like 500,000 customers. And 5% of them is living inside the European Union. And they are living in seven countries and they are taking three different services. It's, it's, uh, it's tough for me. How can we do it? How can we protect? Shall we protect 100% of the information we have about 100% of the users or about just the 5%? And about, what about countries? What about the types of services? You need to have it. So this is why we have what's called data protection impact assessment to assess this situation and to have it in numbers, clear numbers. Build, change, or improve related processes and the procedures related to the output of this assessment. The assessment will help you to know what to do next. And update data subjects with their rights and get their consent. What is consent? I will send an email to each customer. Don't say customer or client. We will say a data subject now telling him or her about what are the pieces of, infor of information I have about him and how I'm using it, how long I will keep them, and how I protect them. And please provide me with your consent to continue providing you with the same service. So you should have what's called data subject consent. What about if the data subject refuses to give you a consent? Because he or she reviews one point of the points you sent in the email. In this case, it will be your decision. Something like, to open a bank account in my bank, you should provide me with 10 pieces of information. One of the customers said no. 
I'd like to provide you with just nine. Can I open an, an, a bank account inside your bank? No, I am sorry. Because legally, I have regulations. I have what's called a central bank. And this information is not mine. It's requested by the central bank in this case. And I should have the 10 pieces of information, not nine. Whatever, what is the 10th one? I will have all of them. In this case, as a service provider, I will not provide you with the service. I will seize the service. And if you are a new customer, I will not provide you with the service. But in other cases, it can be done. But not like banking. So it depends on the case we are talking about. This is a, a, a high level, a main activities, not a detailed activities. But if you are thinking about the compliance process itself, it's a detailed one. For the, let's have it in, 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 let's say, two or three minutes. First of all, define your organization rule. Is my organization a controller? or a, a processor, because it's important. Because some organization saying we are a processor. We have, by the way, many call centers in Egypt, and some of them have up to 7,000 seats. They have 7,000 employees providing services to people inside European Union countries. And they are saying it's, it's the same for us. We are processor. We are not controller. So it's not our problem, it's not our call. No, it's your problem, it's your call. Understand the nature of your customers and their data. What are the types of my customers? What are the data I have about them? Then develop accountability and the data governance inside the organization. All the employees should care about the information about data subjects. Raise awareness, as we said. Define where the data is held and how it's processed, how we deal with the information. After that, with whom the data is shared? Is my organization a controller and I have a processor behind me processing the data of my data subjects? Hire a DBO, and by the way, you don't need to hire a new employee. You can have a current staff employee. You just provide him with training. Develop personal data processing procedures, and it's not easy because it's about how you process your internal functions inside the organization. Develop procedures for incidents. We don't have incidents now, but we should be prepared so that whenever we have an incident, how to deal with the data subject and with the data protection authority. Develop data protection by design for new services. So we will do this for the current services. What about new services? We will design it by taking in mind that there is what's called a data subject and GDPR. Develop data protection impact assessment. Define national regulators. Communicate privacy information to data subject. This is, is number 13. By the way, for the 12 steps before this one, you can rearrange it as you like. You can have this one as the first one or the second, whatever. But for this one, it should be the 13th. Why? Because after that point, the data subject knows his right. And they will contact you. They will ask you for some information. So don't update the data subjects until your organization is totally ready for what will be after that. Obtaining data subject consent by sending an email, an SMS, uh, uh, asking them to, to go to a portal, a website, whatever. Managing subject access requests if they would like to know about the information we have about them. Continual testing, improvement, and auditing all the time. And the importance of this step will increase with the percentage of the data we have about customers among our all data. Manage incidents if they take place. Update relevant regulators and data subjects about the incidents within less than 72 hours, less than three days. And at the end, make needed corrective actions and announce them to the data subjects and regulators. So it's a detailed.
if you would like to know the high level here are seven steps for main activities if you have the detailed something like 17 or 18 activities for BCB, BCB provide training for the GDPR. We have the introduction one day for decision makers to know what is a GDPR, something like this session, but in more details, and it doesn't have an exam. For the foundation, it's two days, including exam, for all related employees, related employees to information processing, which information? The information of data subjects. And if we have a position for the DBO, we can have someone sent to take this training, Certified Data Protection Officer. It's five days, including the exams. You can take this course if you would like to be one of the implementers, consultants, DBOs, uh, governance managers, information security managers, and so on. By the way, for a DBO, we can have one DBO working for more than one organization, which means if my organization is a small one, shall I have only one dedicated DBO? It will be too much for me to pay for something like this. So you can have an external DBO, and this DBO is a contracted DBO for your organization. He's an external consultant who can sign a contract with two or three or four organizations. And in this case, it will be good for small companies because they don't have the luxury of having one dedicated DBO. If you would like to go further with GDPR, you can have a free surf assessment provided by BECB. It's media, so BECB.com, GDPR dash checklist. You can do it with your own self, it's for free. And try to be connected with BECB. Thank you for your time.